Well, good morning. I'm here with Doug and Caitlin to talk about infinite garble and other things. And it's just Tuesday, September 10, 2024. So I guess we should start with Caitlin. Yes, let's uh, let's start with me. <laughs> so I want to talk about the FTC and hardware devices. So I work in the devices field. And device security is something that I think about every day. Um, and also how to make our devices more customer and human centric, right? You know, when you when you pick up a device, there are certain things you expect. You expect that the device is not going to be communicating back to China and spying on you and being a, you know, a, a, an avenue for bad guys to get into your system. You know, you expect it to just do what the package says, and that's it. You you get what you pay for. That's that's what you expect. Well. Some companies have decided to skirt that that those rules, and the FCC is is getting involved. So what am I talking about? So TechDirt has this article by Carl Bode, and essentially, when you buy a product, some manufacturers decide to upgrade the firmware, and sometimes that upgrade will add new subscriptions to features that you normally or originally had for free. Uh, for example, I think Blink cameras got in trouble for this. Um, also, sometimes they will intentionally disable a product uh, so that to, to force you to buy a new one, uh, or just generally make it make your product less useful. Now, upgrades and updates are important for security, um, as well as if you want to add new features, that's great. But if you sell someone a product and you claim it doesn't cost a monthly fee. And then you add that monthly fee in later. Um, the FTC will now go after those companies that do that, as they should. As they should, absolutely. This is unacceptable that companies do this. Yeah, yeah, it seems to fit in with Biden's uh, administration fighting junk fees. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, that failed. Uh, it already in failed. California. Oh. No, it failed in California for service charges and restaurants, um, wage charge. That was supposed to go into effect in July. Oh. And that did not, and people are still angry about it. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't know. Well, anyway. Um... Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, so the article does make reference to two other mm -hmm. big changes. So one was Peloton that added bike owners and 95 dollar fee per month for some reason and yeah. there was apparently a smart baby uh basket bassinet uh that decided to paywall a lot of the bassinet features so yeah and there's a bunch of services that uh, turned off their cloud thing so the device became useless or lost most of its functionality that seems to be pretty I common when you buy an iot device after a couple of years they turn off the cloud <laughs> service <laughs> I, I'm actually going to disagree with you there. I don't think that's the case for the FTC to come in. I think if you buy a device that requires cloud, and you know the company goes under, um, you know there's no expectation that that company is going to keep the cloud services up. Oh yeah, I mean I don't. So, I'm not yeah. saying FTC stopped it. I think yeah, that's yeah. just uh, run. That's something to be aware of when you buy an IoT device. Yeah, if it's got a cloud component. In a couple of years, that might just vanish. Yeah, I mean, definitely if you're developing devices that use cloud, add a secondary feature where you can specify, like, I'm using my own cloud now. <laughs> you know? But, uh, you know, if wishes were fishes. Yeah. So My, my favorite was, I think, uh, there was a drugstore that sold music with DRM. And after a few years, they said, you know, this DRM server is too hard to keep up. So for the next year, we recommend that you use hacking tools to remove the DRM, and they would send you the hacking tools. Nice. Because <laughs> after that, your music won't play anymore. Uh, that was yes. pretty good. Well, anyway, I got a couple about AI. Um, this one is pretty interesting. I had no idea this was happening. It's an article on The Guardian. If journalism is going up in smoke, I might as well get high off the fumes. Apparently, thousands of journalists are being hired to write text to train AI. They've run out of a source. So they have trying to train like an AI technical help bot, and they make up a bunch of questions and have journalists write answers so they can train AI on human-generated answers. He says, I know I'm contributing 
to eliminating the profession of journalism, but at least I get some cash now before it all burns up. It kind of reminds me of a story years ago about how a liberal was writing right-wing talking points for talk radio because he said, well, they pay better. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so anyway, uh, I didn't know that was happening, but I thought it was true. I've heard, I've heard a lot of people say that human-generated content is hard to find anymore, and most of the internet is heavily polluted with AI-generated content. So in fact, people who have a repository of good, high-quality human-generated content like Reddit are making money selling it to train AIs. And uh, this is why Elon Musk claims that his uh, Twitter will be incredibly valuable because he has all this glorious source of useful content. The problem is a whole bunch of Twitter is created by AI. So I'm not sure it's working it's, too well. <laughs> and a lot of a lot of Twitter is has content that would not be suitable for more, most corporations. But he um, loves it in particular, yeah. He no well, I think that he very intentionally has invited some troublemakers onto his platform. The highest quality human content, the Nazi human content, the unfiltered yeah. human content, the stuff he values. Anyway. Yeah, I'm I'm trying not to get you kicked off platforms but yes the n and n a z words you get kicked off content for calling elon musk a nazi you should just get an award for calling elon musk a nazi i mean it's the truth well um, yes it's the truth but yeah if, if you signaled the word nazi too much in a podcast the our overlord ai might think that we're with uh elon and so they'll promote our podcast more <laughs> recommend on twitter more. on twitter and we'll get the wrong type of uh Oh, and YouTube too, I think to some extent. But anyway, um, yeah. and, uh, there's another one I thought was pretty interesting. They asked Uber drivers, apparently Waymo has got these robo taxis in San Francisco. They're now running and they say it's pretty good. They say they're slower than a human driver, but people like them. And so he, this guy asked his Uber driver, what do you think? And he says, we're cooked. We're going to be replaced by robo taxis soon. And the whole uh, business of being an Uber or Lyft driver is probably going to vanish within a couple of years. So that's interesting. And this is uh, the first real real case, I think, of the thing I've been hearing about for years, that AI is going to take away your job. Most of us, I think it's not going to take away our job, but apparently uh, a lot of newspaper writers and Uber drivers think their job really is going to vanish in short order because of AI. So we're going to see. I mean, to be fair, I don't think anyone grows up thinking, I'm going to be an Uber driver. That's my greatest thing in life. And if that is your greatest thing, that is your dream, I think you'd probably go more into like limousine driving and stuff and chauffeuring. So that would be a good plan. But, you know, I yeah. think I've known guys that made their living driving taxi and it's about as good as construction or many other jobs. I mean, it used to be a well-paying job. You could plan to do it for your career and you make enough money to support your family with the medallions and everything. And that's been pretty much disrupted by Uber. Yep. And then Uber's going to get disrupted by Waymo and Zooks and all those people. Apparently so. Yeah. All right, Doug, what have you got? Well, let, let me just add to this. Um, yeah. It's interesting about Waymo. I've seen those in San Francisco. <clears throat> They're, as far as I know, they're only in San Francisco. I don't know about other cities. And only part of the city, I think. Uh, okay, maybe. Um, so there's still a lot before it can um, be widespread in, in other cities, I guess is where I'm going. Well, yeah, because yeah. I think they had an accident and that, had, that set them back. Yeah. What I, what I want to know is how will they keep those driverless cars clean? Because they, they returned to San Francisco, South San Francisco, by the airport, and there's a cleaning service, cleaning repair service. And is it a robot? If it's not no. a robot, well then, well then, there's that's what the drivers can do. They can become car cleaners anyway, car detailers they call them. Yeah, car detailers. You know, I, I'll tell you one business, one profession that one would think is that as uh, no longer exists would be elevator operators do you remember when you get into an elevator maybe yeah. you don't but there'd be an elevator operator that would say floor please yeah i've seen that and so they take the elevators up and down mm -hmm. and as a kid i remember that in macy's or capwell's some of the department stores there was somebody there they had an eight-hour shift of driving an elevator 
one would think with automation, elevator operator profession is gone. I think I, it did decline by 99%. Yeah. So here's a little piece of trivia. Where can you still get a job as an elevator operator? I've seen him somewhere, but I forget where. Maybe a museum. I can't remember. I, I imagine the the space um, when you go up the elevator to go into the, the rocket, I imagine there's probably an operator in there. Yeah, but that's only, yeah, yeah. Well, in regular um, operation, in other words, on a daily basis, where where could you get a job? I, I oh, would Dubai. argue. Dubai. <laughs> Dubai. <laughs> All right, let's limit this to the U.S. Turns out yeah. it's Disneyland yeah. for the rides and theme parks. I noticed that pattern of interactions there is just like when someone offers you a ten thousand dollar bug bounty, like uh, uh, the, uh, Mike Lindell did this. He promised you a bounty, and people submit something. Oh no, not that one. Then submit another. Oh no, not that one. You know? <laughs> yeah. Right. And the other place is in New York. Apparently, there's a 50-passenger elevator to get to the subway. And that has to be manned by an elevator operator. Ah, okay. Well. So, all right. So, first story that I have is Apple did their great announcement yesterday of new versions of existing products. So, we're going to see a new Apple Watch, their new earbuds, new iPhones coming out. And out of all of those, I'm not an Apple Watch or Apple Watch or a, a watch wearer, but the watch is thinner, bigger, a lot of extra features in there that people want. <clears throat> Sounds to me not that interesting. That was the my, earbuds. I saw, the, I saw the articles and I didn't even post any of them because it sounds like really nothing, minor incremental and gains. I mean, if a watch would read your blood pressure, I'd like that, but it can't do that. And yeah, none of them yeah. seem to have any like killer new features. Well, the earbuds, I would argue they do. Um, they have a couple of features in there. One is that they can do a hearing test. So later this year, whatever that means, uh, Apple will release a um, app that in five minutes you can get your hearing tested. And the claim is that over 60, 75 percent of Americans who are of of a certain age category, let's say, um, have a hearing loss and don't even know it, wow. and could benefit from earbuds. And with the uh, um, hearing aids that that are out there, commercially available, high end, people can spend up to ten thousand dollars. And Apple's earbuds for a couple hundred dollars are going to offer a feature that's fairly close. Okay. If they actually work as hearing aids, then yeah, they, that yeah. would be a big market for them to go into. You know, if they do that test carefully, they can get in trouble. I used to work in psychophysics. And one thing yeah. about this is if you measure your hearing, there's a very steep cutoff at the high end. So steep that you can measure what your limit of perception is easily and precisely and the researchers that did this at my clinic didn't publish it and gave up because it's so depressing because you can watch it fall like over days and weeks your high end goes down through your life and it goes down by pretty fast and you can watch it go down i'm up to 15.75 and now 15.74 15.73 you can just so measure it going oh, down oh over the course of how much time just a few days or weeks because it falls off so fast. If you just play a sound and say, did you hear this one? Did you hear that one? You yeah. can measure it to like just a few hertz and it's around 15 kilohertz. So you lose a few hertz every day and you can oh, measure oh, that. I see, yeah. I see, I see. So at what time have you lost your hearing completely? Oh, I don't think you ever lose the lower registers. The high end goes down. And that's why, you know, uh, like, you know, when I listen to music, I can't really hear the cymbals. I, I hear the bass and stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. So what you're saying is in 200 years, we'd lose our hearing or, or a thousand no, I years. Know. I don't know. I, I don't know the exact yeah. biological flaw here. I think little hairs are breaking off in your ear. And I don't know if you'd ever lose the really low frequency. I don't know if it works that way. 
I see, I see, yeah. I see. So if you were to project that out, it might be a thousand years. And it might be that it just hits some limit where you've lost the whole upper yeah. register. And you yeah, have so we don't know. So. Okay. So the other one they came out with is the iPhone. And the iPhone is going to have AI, Apple intelligence. Yeah. And it's a little bit larger, uh, the phones are, than existing. So they're making more use. And in terms of features, Apple has put a lot into the camera and video editing, video and audio editing. And I'm not a photographer. I'm not a videographer. I don't play with very much with sound. But it's pretty interesting that you're getting close to professional quality when it comes to some of the tools that they have. So in other words, you can isolate tracks. Um, you can remove wind noise. Uh, again, with the, the camera, they've got a wide angle lens, more zooming capabilities. So, you know, there, there's a lot in there. The iPhone I could see as being a compelling buy. Yeah. And I'm, I've am i been in the market for an iPhone, so I'm a little bit overdue. So I'll probably get one of these. And I'm at the age now where I think I'm going to go for the Max version for yeah, the bigger sc screen real estate. I was thinking the same thing. My 10 is sort of getting old and wonky. Yeah. <laughs> probably yeah. going to have to get a new one. <laughs> so, you know, do the trade-in. Apple offers a trade-in. Interesting, Apple's really big on zero carbon. So the packaging is totally recycled. Yeah. And they claim that the titanium that's in the phone, I think, is 95% recycled. Well, it still uses electricity, which might come from fossil fuels. So I think it should come with like a radioactive isotope powering it. Right, right. I, I know. It's so, it's so funny. Yeah, it's yeah. so funny because, you know, Apple is trying to reduce carbon emissions in their phones and making it green. Meanwhile, they're still making it small and, um, you know, uh, using tantalum capacitors, which, of course, requires the mining of coltan, where, which is basically a uh, blood mineral. <laughs> oh, a lot of hands getting chopped off, you know. Well, Caitlin, but, but the phones are getting smaller. So they're using less of it. Uh, that is not how it works. Oh, it's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. yeah. So in order in order to make the phone smaller, they have to use uh, expensive components, um, yeah. including tantalum, which, like I said, comes from coltan, which is a conflict mineral. So, yeah. There yeah, you go. Okay. Well, so you know, Apple. I, I listened to part of the presentation yesterday, and um, a lot of hype. And it, it's, you know, Apple did a very good job, as they always do. Yeah. But I'll tell you, having watched a lot of these new version announcements, updates, it's kind of the same story. Just get to it and make the presentation a lot shorter. Yeah. Is my attitude on this. Where's the beef, so to speak? Yeah. It's a theatrical presentation. Yeah. Like the Democratic yeah. National Convention. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, Sam, you got a story for us or Caitlin? Well, let's, yeah, let's go back to Caitlin. Okay. All right. So here's something I didn't know what was going on, but I've, I've heard discussions about something similar um, in the far right Nazi extremist movements. Uh, so let me pull up my window here. Oops. There we go. Uh, so this is from The Hill, and this is by Zach uh, Budrick. And apparently a bunch of extremists, right-wing Nazi people, are going after the electrical grid. And this has happened multiple times. And they give an example of two former Marines uh, that were neo-Nazis. And they stole some equipment from Camp uh, Lezun. Uh, and they wanted to attack a power substation. And they, they of course, got got caught and sent to jail. But it, this happens again and, and again. And it's really funny because these extremists, basically their their ideology is this. Okay. Uh, they think that the world is going to collapse and they want to hasten the collapse because then there will be a revolution and then the white...
find the people that have like the solar panels and start charging batteries and figure out a way around it for the month, right? <laughs> That's what would happen. It would well, be annoying, but we'd survive. Um, and we, we would well, be upset. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, PG&E cut power to us for several mm -hmm. days. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and remember, so PG&E is always threatening this. They're called PSPS, Public Service Power Shortage. No, it's not a shortage. I can't remember what it's called now, what the abbreviation is. But it's when there are high winds in the Sierras, and there's a, a potential for it to cause a wildfire. You know, the, the yeah. high, high voltage transmission lines. So PG&E... Uh, it's been several years, but we had two of those. One of them lasted for, I think, three days. Wow. That's... Sam, you were affected by that. I didn't didn't cut my power for three days. I remember like 15 years ago or in the time of Enron, they had rolling blackouts, but they were like two hours. Yeah. Here, I'm looking. It's called public safety power shutoff. Yeah. Prepare your home and family for unexpected power outages with our expert guide. PG&E has a guide on this. And you didn't like get torches and kill your neighbors in response? No, but, you know, we did have it, it has um, spurred the sale of Generac. Um, right. Generators. You know, yeah. generators. Yeah. And Being my neighbors, I have two, I have two or three neighbors that installed those. Which yeah. I think is kind of silly, but well, you know, I understand. Um, if you get an F one hundred and fifty, it can like power your house for two days from your electric car. That's another alternative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, so so back to the article. So the yeah. the term, the philosophy, if you can call it that, because it's so stupid, is called the accelerationism, which is the idea that if you create conflict. Uh, it'll bring about all this fighting, and then finally there will be the revolution, and it's just it just won't happen. But what will happen though is if you take out the power grid, there will be some people that depend on it, right? People with, you know, breathing oxygen masks or whatever, like you know, life support equipment. They're the ones who are going to be put in danger, and people could potentially die. Uh, yeah, so it's, I can it's see yeah. It. Caitlin, yeah. I could see all those people running out into the street with torches and pitchforks. Yeah. All set. Oh, oh, wait, but their oxygen tubing isn't long enough, is it? Right, exactly. I mean, those, those, yeah. I, you're absolutely right. Those would be the only people that would be that upset. Well, so um, if, this is yeah. from the CIA plan, which was a real plan. They do encourage revolution in other countries and they tell people to like blow up the public toilets and block the railroads and just break everything to encourage people to rebel against their government. So if enough of this happens, it does cause unrest and it does cause people to hate their government. Um, that, so it is, it is a well-time-tested policy. The U.S. has been using it against other nations for decades. Yeah, but taking out the power grid is not going to do it. And it's not going to cause what they call what they call helter skelter, which is the right. term they use for the, the race war um, that they think is going to happen from cutting out the power, which isn't going to happen. But our electrical grid is you know, at risk from these extremists who are just too stupid to do a, anything correctly. So, Well, as usual, I'm here to be the fascist apologist. I mean, I understand what they're doing, and I understand why. If you listen to like Steve Bannon's War Room, the point is you expect there to be like a group like this in every town, and they will be breaking everything until they cause a revolution. And that is that does work in other nations. We've done it for decades. It's, you're right, blowing up one substation won't do it, but if everybody just keeps wrecking everything, then eventually you yeah. create unrest. Yeah, I mean, I, if you create a culture of revolution yeah. and you, every day someone's breaking something and you have groups breaking stuff all the time, yeah. that would, that would okay, I, would, I could see that. And that's the problem they is- believe. They believe if yeah. I heroically take my shotgun and shoot the substation, then all my brothers out there will form their groups and blow up something too because they're just waiting for the opportunity to rebel against this horrible fascist government. Yeah, well, the problem is that they do not realize how small and how much of a minority they themselves yeah. are. So there's this, most Americans are just do not want that. We just want to live together in peace and, wow. you know.
Uh, see, that's what I used to believe. And I remember telling a student 10 years ago, there's only 1% Nazis in America and they'll never get any power. Right now, I mean, Trump is threatening to kill and jail his political enemies and half of Americans support him. So in some ways, I think there are a lot of Americans around us that are in fact very anxious to have effectively a violent overthrow of our government, <laughs> far more than I ever no, believed. Well, well, this is how fascist rights to power. It's not that all the people are suddenly fascist too. They just are like, well, you know, that's their, they're being hyperbolic, you know, it's, well, it's not going to affect me. And, you know, it, it's, you know, they make some good points here and there. I don't necessarily agree with everything they say, but, you know, let's just give them a shot. You know, they, you know, things aren't that good anyway, you know, and things just fall apart from there because people don't have that core central values that they adhere right. to. Right. I mean, what yeah. you have is you have a group of people that's maybe like 5% that really are violent extremists. And then you have a whole bunch of sort of followers that will just sort of go along with whatever's happening. I, I would even say it's less than 5%. I don't think 90, I don't think 5% of Americans are like violent Nazis. I think it's even less than that. I hope you're right. But I know it's possible for your government to be, you know, to be, uh, for democracies to fail. This is how they fail in other countries. And it yeah. certainly could happen here. It can, which is why I, I think this election more than any other is such a no brainer. I mean, we're, we're up against a literal um, federal prosecutor versus yeah. a seditionist and a uh, and a criminal. Um, yeah. You know, I so, love Dick I mean, Cheney. Yeah. Dick Cheney said it right. He said, I disagree with Kamala about everything, but I'm voting for her because she's better than Trump. And I think yes. that's exactly where we are. Yeah, uh, you know. Anyway. Yeah. Well, anyway. so you, you know, Sam, it, it's interesting you bring up this about um, what do you call it again? Um, acceler accelerationism. Yeah. Acceleration. yeah. Accelerationism. Which I, I um, the term is used for multiple things. It's also used by the AI proponents for the AGI that will take over the world. But anyway, Helder's Kelter, of course, is the original one. Uh, Charles Manson wanted to do this in the 60s. He wanted to start a race war by provoking a little violence. And then he thought the whole country would erupt because they believe that the whole country is just about ready to explode, which apparently is not really true. Yeah. And that actually was a Beatles song, oh, yeah. Hilter yeah. Skelter. Yeah. And I'm just looking up this. It's 52nd on the 100 greatest Beatles songs. Yeah. So... Yeah, but I mean, did, it's a real did, old idea, right? Yeah, back so does the communist revolution. Hold, you just need to start people off, and then they will tear off their chains and overthrow the government. Yeah. So does does the our government's helter skelter plan uh, go back prior to this? Well, I don't know that. You don't know, okay? Because yeah. you had mentioned that. I only know it back. I only know Charles Manson's part of it. But I mean, this is a really old idea. And basically, the American yeah. Revolution against Britain was essentially this. You know, at some point, you get mad enough that everybody sort of bands together and throws the tea in the harbor and right. rebels against the government. Yeah. It does happen. Yeah, and it has happened in our country. Yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, um, so I want to share my screen. Uh, sure. And uh, talk about my highly technical next, which is the uh, feature, which is infinite garble. So uh, let me figure out how to share the right screen here. Number three, there we go. All right. So I, I this is the um, U.S. government recommended uh, box cipher encryption modes, which have been around since 2001. The official government recommendation, there's electronic code book where you encrypt each block of plain text separately. And there's cipher block chaining, which became popular after people realized how bad this one was. Which where you take each block and you take the output and use it as a an initialization vector to effectively randomize the next block, and that turned out to have a serious flaw, and lead to um, the padding oracle attack. And so people wanted a better one. And what most people did in the modern world is they switched to counter mode, shown here in the bottom right, and in particular to this one called uh, Galois counter mode, which just adds another random number to each. Um, block of text before you encrypt it, and it just uses some kind of complicated Galois function to predict the 
to create these random numbers you add. So this is what's recommended, and almost everybody's using it now. But Signal, or not Signal, Telegram. Telegram uses this thing called infinite garble mode. And I heard about it, and I said, that sounds like the stupidest thing in the world. The name is stupid, but the actual mode is not really stupid at all. The problem with the um, the cause of cipher block chaining is you have this uh, uh, fail, is you take the output of the first block as the initialization vector for the next block, and that's too simple, so there's a pattern you can use to break in. So here you just have two initialization vectors, and you swap them, and you have two initialization vectors in each block. It seems simple and logical and fast, and probably is fine. So I just thought it was interesting. This was invented for OpenSSH, OpenSSL, and then never used again. It just never became the official US government standard. And I've been listening to several podcasts and stuff talking about uh, Telegram and what's wrong with Telegram. And and their defense is interesting and actually kind of related to the politics we were just talking about. Um, they do this and they do a lot of weird cryptography, non-standard things. And by the way, so does Kaspersky antivirus. Years ago, I thought I found a flaw in Kaspersky because it updates over HTTP, not HTTPS. And I said, that's incredible. You could man in the middle of that and modify the update. And when I tried it, it didn't work. And I found out that they had invented their own alternative to HTTPS, which amounted to about the same thing. And this is a, so this is a thing I've seen in a few Russian products. And that's what the Pavel Durov said, he said, I know we're not doing it the official U.S. government way because we don't trust the U.S. government. We assume that all their recommendations are backdoored and you Americans are stupid anyway. We know better math, so I'm doing it the Russian way. My Russian mathematician has invented a better way to do it. And that's not entirely stupid. So anyway, I thought it was interesting. Uh, people have argued about um, there's a lot of problems at Telegram. Uh, they don't actually encrypt much of anything at all. And they refuse to cooperate with any content moderation decisions from government, which is how they got in trouble in France. But in fact, it's an interesting semi-political argument why they use these strange cryptography procedures instead of what have become the standard. And basically, it's largely that they're out of date. And they defined their cryptography around 2005 and never updated it. But it's also because they're just, you know, not willing to trust the official U.S. government recommendation. And that makes a little bit of sense for a Russian product. Anyway. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Yeah. What's up? What have you got, Doug? Yeah. So, uh, Sam, you forwarded this to me. So hmm. we talked a while back about a Michigan teenager who committed suicide over a sextortion. Um, not exploit, but I guess attack or interaction where there were, I think, two or three Nigerians that were extorting money out of him. And this also happened to a lawmaker from lawmaker's son from now North or South Carolina. Anyway, the three, I believe there were three, they were extradited from Nigeria and have now been convicted of his murder. And I believe they have life sentences that will be um, carried out in the U S. Yes. So, I mean, apparently we extradite people from Nigeria to the U.S. for cybercrime, which is interesting, and I was not aware yeah. of that. I don't quite know what our political, you know, friendliest with Nigeria is, but if we could actually extradite Nigerian sham scammers to the U.S. to prosecute them, I think there'll be a lot of them. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I think they went after this. It's, it's interesting to me that they went after this one for the Michigan teenager. And I'm waiting to hear what's going to happen to the son's um, uh, um, the the uh, lawmaker's son, the, the one that perpetrated the crime against him. Yeah. yeah. Um, that one is a little bit newer, but it you know we should be hearing something out of that. And what's pretty disturbing about that crime is after the son committed suicide for a week or two weeks later, the people in Nigeria that encouraged him to commit suicide or resulted in him, in him taking, uh, taking his life had been tormenting his father by, by sending ha-ha and, you know, text messages to him, emails to him. 
Yeah, well, you know, when you consider how to stop these things, it, you know, if everybody was doing it, it would be really hard to stop. And then you need fleets of content moderators. But if it's a small number of people, just arresting them might work. I remember a few years ago, yeah. they said almost all the spam comes from like 10 people and almost all the robocalls. And a bunch of these things, uh, in fact, law enforcement may be the best solution because there really is not that many people doing it. And you could just lock them up. Yeah, and we already obviously have laws against this. Well, sure. But I mean, the law is no good. Like if you pass a law against speeding or marijuana, it does nothing because so many people are doing it, you can't arrest them all. But if it really is just a small number of people doing it, then locking them up becomes a practical deterrent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So, you know, that's that's kind of a closure on that Mexican, uh, Michigan teenager and the yeah. sextortion. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be good to think if they lock up the people doing that. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what have you got, Caitlin? I have bad rockets. Bad, bad rockets. So Bad rockets. Bad rockets. Yeah. The uh, Jeff Faust over on Space News has an article. And I'll pull it up here. Uh, essentially, there's been some problems with some Centaur uh, upper stages of, as they've been delivering payloads to geostationary orbit. Uh, they've been breaking up. And there's a Twitter post here where we can actually see the, uh, if it will load, yeah, here we go, come on, um, where we can see how it's breaking up. So basically the way this works is that you synchronize your telescope to the where your object is in the sky. And then you take a long exposure and you can see where the debris are or, or the object you're tracking is. So in this case, it'll just, or in all these cases, it'll show up as a dot, whereas the stars in the background will show up as streaks. So here we see a pre-breakup of a centaur upper stage um, in this, it's just a single dot. And then, uh, they later found, looked at it again, and saw that it had broken up into more than 40 pieces just on its own, uh, hanging out there. And this is not trivial because these upper stages are in an orbit going between about 7,000 kilometers in height to about 35,000 kilometers. So it's, I mean, it's in a junkyard orbit, but it's still, it's not coming down. These are up there basically forever. Um, and now they're sort of breaking up on their own, and which is, you know, very difficult to track. So uh, this is a big problem. So the FAA is going to get involved and they've already have proposed new regulations for how Centaur upper stages or any sort of rocket upper stages should operate in the future. In particular, when you leave an upper stage, so it's delivered its payload and it's now in like graveyard mode, is this going to sit there for the rest of its life? You have to make sure that all the batteries are fully drained, all the uh, fuel and everything has been depleted, uh, you know, stuff like that. So it does not break up again. And like I said, this isn't the first time this has happened. Apparently, this has happened four times uh, since 2018. So well, this is this is a real problem. Um, and and unlike low Earth orbiting debris, like I said, these these aren't coming back. They're they're up there for essentially forever at this point. Yep. The Kessler effect, right? It's it's not as bad as the Kessler effect. The Kessler effect is low Earth orbit, where you have all these tight spacecraft in low Earth orbit. And if they one bumps into another, which then creates a bunch of debris, which then hits another, which creates more debris, and and suddenly the Earth is enveloped by by this debris. Uh, these, the, the upper stages are much further away than low Earth orbit. So they'll never get down that low for thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years. But it's a permanent problem at that point um, that you sort of have to track and make sure you don't hit as you're taking your um, satellite to geostationary orbit. And those are, the, and yeah, uh, and it will pass through, um, through medium Earth orbit, you know, satellite spaces. The problem is that it's so vast at that point. You're talking about a sphere from here to geostationary orbit, that it's very unlikely that there will be a collision as opposed to in low Earth orbit where things are just sort of sort of close to each other, separated by maybe 10 kilometers at times. You know, it's 
not as bad as Kessler, but it's still a, a problem that you have to keep track of. And, you know, and if you do it too much, I, I imagine, yeah, you could have something similar to Kessler effect. Okay. All right. Well, the, the last one I've got is um, there's a, an article came out about nine months ago talking about the Visual Studio reverse shell, which is pretty amazing. You know, if you get the ability to execute code on somebody's machine while hacking them, like you get them to click on a link or download something, then the problem is if you run known malware, their anti-malware will catch it. But Microsoft Visual Studio Code has a command line option to just open a reverse shell connection. It's built into the official signed Microsoft product. What could be more beautiful than this? This is like Microsoft Recall just putting a keylogger on everyone's machine for you. How convenient. And so I read about this nine months ago, and now it's being used. Um, Chinese APTs are using it to attack Asian governments. Um, it's uh, pretty interesting. And it reminds me of like there's a uh, sysinternals tool that executes code on another person's machine. So I mean, this is just another uh, signed trusted binary that won't set off any flags that you can use as part of your living off the land attack. And I thought it was interesting that it's in, in active use now. Anyway. It, yeah. So the WRC CDC red team was actually just talking about that. Yeah. And the problem that we were facing is that the visual studio binaries um, are kind of obvious. Like if you go into process manager, you can sort of see that they're there. Uh, what we're going to be looking for are Microsoft signed binaries that load DLLs that are not part of the windows system. Yeah. And then basically we'll run uh, like, you know, Microsoft something, you know, msdb or something like that, .exe, which then loads msdb.dll, but we'll replace that DLL and then just sort of hijack the process from there. That's great. Those things are thick on the ground. I wrote those in my classes. I mean, BG yep. code does it. There's a ton of code that loads DILs unsafely. And a lot of it is from yeah. Microsoft and signed and trusted. This is yeah, the number so, one way malware executes. So students, that's what we're, we're you know, you're, you're screwed. <laughs> you're not going to find our malware. <laughs> Don't worry. It's not going to be, we're not going to make it that easy for you. Um, but yeah. definitely in my experience, the the real threat actors are lazy. They, they don't do like, it, it's very funny because, you know, we train students um, with, uh, you know, our advanced red team tactics and we have all this advanced malware that's, you know, loaded up as drivers and as root kits and all this stuff. But the real threat actors are really just using like VS code and stuff like that. So, well, I think there's a, a pyramid like anything. There's a low level. Most attackers are low level and use simple attacks. And then there's the APTs that are the fancy people. They use the fancy stuff when they really have to. I mean, even the APTs, um, in my experience, <laughs> they're not as advanced as, as I would have thought. Um, yeah. Like even the big hacks, I'm like, oh, that's like pretty obviously malware you're, you're using there, China. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, this Sherlock Holmes complained about this too, that the criminals are just not worth my time. Or I've heard of the brilliant people that would make a worthy adversary. Yeah, uh, that was definitely how I... I mean, I'm not going to say I felt like that specifically, but I was very much looking forward when I was on the blue team to find all these brilliant hackers and seeing what they were doing and really dive deep into what, what they were creating. And that never happened. So, yeah, I see the even, even, yeah. occasionally people find interesting things like this. But, you know, of course, yeah. most people just use tried and true techniques because they still work. Yeah. Even so, even during the big hacks, I was like, yeah, it's okay. Like you used a password. <laughs> you wrote some bad code. Okay. It's as if all they wanted to do was steal stuff and they didn't do the do this out of their technical joy of making a beautiful attack, you know. I know it's it's disappointing. Yeah. All right. Have you got another one, Doug? Yeah, I have one more. This is from Marketplace mm -hmm. or Marketplace Tech. And they have a warning about the threat of posted rumors of non-citizen voting. And what they did is they did some research because there's been a lot of claims of non-citizens voting. And they found out that, yeah, there are a few cases, but it's not as widespread as with the pictures and what the headlines lead everyone to believe. And I also put up a link that I think is uh, you put up on the website that the Heritage Foundation, this is from the New York, New York Times, 
spreads deceptive videos about non-citizen voters and how they're changing the outcome potentially of elections. So again, this is not to say it doesn't happen, but what's happened is it's spread way out of proportion. And a lot of this is kind of baiting non-citizens to be asking if they're voting. They don't quite understand the question. And in an interview, they'll say that they will vote. And again, it, it's clipped very carefully to uh, deceive and, and alter what the truth is. So, I thought this was a total myth. I mean, I heard uh, studies that said the total number of non-citizens that vote is like 500 in a, over the whole country, not enough to really matter anywhere, which is what I, yeah. I mean. Yeah, however, Heritage Foundation and TikTok and other influencers are spreading uh, spreading this around. It's a, it's a big deal. Yeah. Well, that's when it's of, when it's not. When well, it's sure. Not. I mean, that's part of yeah. Trump's plan to like claim he won when he lost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's basically following the Russian uh, disinformation plan of just discrediting democracy, saying, you know, you can't count the votes anyway. Democracy doesn't work. You should just have a dictatorship. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we have those uh, Russians that were arrested last week, weren't they? Yeah, yeah for promoting yeah. Kremlin messages through American influencers. It's, um, it's always this pressure that democracy is irritating us. Why don't you knock it off over there? Wait, it, so yeah. what happened? Yeah. What happened with American influencers? Oh, they the Russians, uh, they caught the Russians. Uh, they said we made, uh, they gave $10 million to a Tennessee company to pretend to be an American company. And then they paid right wing podcasters to create pro Kremlin talking points like Ukraine is horrible and they're full of Nazis and Putin is great. And uh, they found the people that were pretty much saying that anyway, and they funded them. Oh yeah, no, I, I, that's not surprising. Uh, I read an, I read a study recently that they asked people who were TikTok users and people who are not TikTok users right. what they thought of the Chinese government, and the TikTok users had a higher opinion of the Chinese government. I mean, there's so much propaganda going on on these social media networks because they're largely unregulated. You don't know who's speaking. You don't know who's funding them, and the people that get the loudest voices oftentimes do this like full-time, it's like full-time career to be an influencer. And then they have, you know, sponsors and whatnot. And most of it's commercial, you know, like, oh, you know, check out this new product. But sometimes it is political, absolutely. And and they're claiming that when they got offered to get paid $100,000 per video or $400,000 a month for just four videos, that this is just a normal price. I had no reason to suspect this was foreign money. And the Podcasters I listen to are outraged, saying, I work so hard. I don't make that kind of money. How could you believe that anybody would pay you for making this crap that much money? You should have known it was crooked. But anyway. Yeah, I mean, there's just there's very little money to be made in truth and yeah. in, you know, good, good moral upstanding. Um, I know any content I put on YouTube, including this podcast, it is I am not paid. I don't make a cent. I don't monetize any videos. I don't monetize any content. Yeah, there's no particularly point. for that reason. Yeah, there's no point. Oh, I well, mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I yeah. thought it was funny. Um, oh, maybe I've forgotten. But there's a uh, anyway. This has been oh yeah. How the right the uh, truth makes very little money. Remember, Al Franken used to go and give a comedy show, and he would give it. You'd meet like the Republican National Convention, Republican committees, and he would just tell them they were horrible and rotten and put them down, but they'd laugh and they say, "Why do you do this? Why don't you talk to the liberals?" And he said, "They can't afford me." <laughs> so anyway, it's uh, the money is on the right. There's, I mean, what's funny is that there are some very wealthy left wing, left leaning people, yeah. but the, the, there's a lot of people that feel like it's worth spending their money to promote right wing agendas to make more money back. Essentially, there, it's like an investment. It is. Yeah. I mean, if they they can get a tax cut, that'll pay or lower the uh, pollution regulations, they'll make a ton of money from that. So it's worth donating some portion of that money to Republican causes to keep the cash money flowing. Right. And but what's really funny is that these are short term gains. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, the economy does better with more you know progressive leadership. 
uh, but it is at a cost. Like you don't get those short term, you know, tax cuts. Uh, you just get longer term stability and longer term profits over the course of 10, 20 years. But that's not what corporations and most organizations are really after. They're after this quarter's, you know, profit margin, which really dictates so much of our policy in the United States. And it's also the old tragedy of the commons. The rich people don't care if we pollute all the water because they will live in a mansion and pay for expensive bottled water. So it's fine. You know, you don't actually want the whole economy to go up. They just want to get more for themselves, even if that depletes everybody else. Right. And it, it's an offshoot of nimbyism, which is yeah. that, you know, they, um, you know, that they're not necessarily bad people. They're just, you know, it's not their problem if other people have their water polluted. And if it is, you know, and, and if their water does get polluted, well, they should just move not into my backyard, you know, not where I live, mm -hmm. have solutions there. They, they can do their own solution somewhere, you know, and just not not take uh, responsibility for, for problems in society, make it yeah. someone else's problem. And that goes all the way back. This is why one thing I'm kind of worried about, Kamala Harris wants to build 3 million new houses. And she's absolutely right that we need more houses, but I don't know how you can possibly do it because all the neighborhoods you want houses in will all say, no, you're not building them here because that lower my property values. So you have like a global, a large scale good, which would have to overcome a uh, small scale demand. So I don't know how you can do it. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing that we never talk about fixing the the housing crisis is that if we build more houses, that means the price of, of housing will go down. So people's investments will that's start losing money and no, and none of the homeowners will want that. But of course, they're the ones with wealth. Well, you know, and... Trump has a plan to get more housing, deport oh. 20 million immigrants, and then we can live in their houses. You know, San Francisco in particular has a history of, of this, particularly during World War II when we interned uh, Japanese Americans. Of course, we're on the West Coast, so we have a very multicultural um living situation here with a lot of people from East Asia, including Japanese Americans. And of course, when the when the um, US government interned uh, Japanese American citizens, American citizens, mind you. Oh, yeah. Wait, wait, uh, Caitlin, Caitlin yeah. let me add to that. Not yes. only did they intern Japanese citizens, American citizens, they interned Italian American citizens as well. Right. So it um, wasn't limited just to the Japanese. But as far as I know, they never did the Germans. Right. They never did the Germans. Too they many the, of them. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but absolutely, this, this was a problem. Particular, I'm, I'm talking particularly in San Francisco because San Francisco, I, like I, I said, am. is very I'm, large. I'm yeah, talking yeah, West yeah. Coast. Yeah. The yeah, Italians yeah. were housed in Daly City mm -hmm. or Pacifica. Right. So between but, the Italian, yeah. yeah, sorry, and then yeah, and then a bunch of white people um, moved into their houses when they were interned, and yeah, it it was it was a tragedy, and I don't know if we've ever properly sort of remedied that situation, um, but it's something that I I'm not keen on the U.S. repeating um, in any sort of capacity. Well, you've heard of Japanese fortune cookies, right? I think you're thinking of Chinese. No, Japanese fortune cookies were created in San Francisco just over 100 years ago. When World War II came along, the Japanese were interned, so they became Chinese fortune cookies. Oh, that's terrible. That's no, And that's the original plates to make the cookies are still, uh, they're in San Francisco on display in a, for, a Japanese fortune cookie museum. You know... That actually makes sense because the Jap the fortune cookie is folded in such a delicate, fancy way, like like sushi, and it doesn't fit the Chinese aesthetic. Now that you mention it, there you go. I never and realized that, but it always seemed incongruous and wrong. This like perfectly folded, precise cookie thing at the end of a Chinese meal, which is not that way at all. Yeah, it's an it's oh. an origami, isn't it? Yeah, and not it also well. tastes. It also tastes horrible, just like most Japanese desserts. Yeah, so that makes sense. Much sugar in it, you know. Now this <laughs> yeah. actually makes sense of something sort of been bothering me my whole life. Now that you mentioned it, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, they were started in San Francisco. Yeah. 
Well, um, it, it you know, Caitlin, that's it's a really interesting story. Um, we could go in there, there are a lot of ways, uh, a lot of different directions we could take that. Yeah, I mean, par part of America's problem is that we have these things in our past, right? We have slavery, we have internment camps. Yeah. Yep. And then we we all sort of admit, okay, that was wrong, but we never actually like heal or do any sort of justice about it afterwards, um, so that we can sort of collectively heal. Um, well, and so we, we, we yeah, on the contrary, we, we're we're fixing to do it all again, apparently. Yeah, apparently. Well, we we did give reparations to the Japanese. It was trivial, mm -hmm. and very it was trivial, yeah. yeah, very trivial. And if you go to the Central Valley. There were a lot of Japanese that were living there that were farmers. And when they were interned, all those were all those farms, and I'm loosely saying, but a lot of them were taken over by Chinese. And so right. it switched from Japanese to Chinese. When the Japanese were released, they weren't able to retain or or uh, take their get their farms back. Right. But if you want to go back on this, the whole Bay Area, especially specifically I'm going to talk about the East Bay was owned by a land grant from the Peraltas from Spain. And you probably heard of Peralta community college. Mm -hmm. There's a, a lot of uh, Peralta name is still out there, but remember Spain stole the land, if you will, from the native Americans. Yeah. So we seem to have a history of doing that. But when um, at the time of the gold rush, when the, miners came back to the Bay Area, realizing that they couldn't um, make a fortune in gold, a lot of them just set up homesteads on Peralta's land. And for the next 30 years, the Peraltas sued and tried to win in court. They lost initially, and they had to sell off a lot of, the, a lot of their land. And by that time, the East Bay had been settled but the Peraltas were eventually victorious and won nothing in return. In other words, they never got yeah. their land back. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of a lot of the land in uh, Northern California, in particular, yeah. and in the East Bay, um, is on essentially sacred uh, Native American land, including burial sites and stuff. Uh, which uh, yeah. is another sort of tragedy that that we just sort of don't really talk about. So. Yeah, yeah. It, it, California has an interesting history, and in something that I recently learned was I was always taught in grade school that California was a free state and that we didn't support slavery. And boy, was that wrong. Before California reached statehood, we definitely supported slavery. And at the time of the gold rush, and I never really thought about this, but a lot of Southerners came with their slaves to make a fortune in the gold fields. So it brought Southern influence in slavery. And California was about 80, 90% pro-slavery at the time of statehood. Hmm. And there was one man that was sent by Lincoln that you've probably never heard of. His name is Thomas Starr King. You ever heard of him? There's a statue of him in Golden Gate Park. There's a statue of him in California at the Capitol. And there was a statue of him in uh, Washington, D.C., in the Capitol building where all the statues are. But he was recently replaced by Ronald Reagan. And Thomas Starr King, his body is in San Francisco in a crypt and he's one of the only bodies i think there are four that are not in a cemetery it's at a, a church he was a, a minister and it's at the church where up by where the fireman's fund building used to be there's a church there his crypt is still there and he came to california he was considered one of the best orators in the country and he crisscrossed the state convincing everybody that we should be a free state. Wow. And he raised on his own something like in in 1860s dollars, something on the order of four or five billion dollars to convince Californians to go 
to be a free state. Now, I think that's a tragedy of, of um, kind of rearranging history. I mean, we've glossed over part of it, but we ignore the slavery part. And slavery did exist, not only with the Spaniards when it came to the missions, but also during the time of the gold rush. Yep, yeah. Absolutely. And we don't, yeah. we don't talk about that in, in California history class. So that sounds like a very yes. interesting guy like Martin Luther King of his time. Yeah, yeah, he was, he died early of, I think tuberculosis or a lung disease in his forties. Um, but yeah, you know, it's interesting. There are only, I think three school, three schools in California named Thomas Starr King. And interesting, I believe he did most of his work in the Bay Area. Hmm. And um, one of the schools is in Los Angeles. And the kids who went to the school had never heard of him, don't know who he is. And the other tragedy is, why did we replace his statue in the Capitol building in Washington, DC for Ronald Reagan? Who did more for our state? or for our country. And people still don't know who he is. Yeah. So, you know, we well, rewrite I, history, don't we? Yeah, that's very interesting stuff. Yeah. But anyway, I, yeah. Think, I think that's it for this one. And I'm done. We've yeah. kind of gone on a little tangents there, but hopefully it's interesting. Oh, I think yeah. it is. And people can't argue about the price. <laughs> but, uh, there you go. All right. Yep. Yeah. All right. And we'll have another one of these on Friday. Very well. Sounds good. We'll see everybody then. All right. I have to find the right button. There we go.